engineers, we start off with a challenge. So I'll talk to you about a problem, a problem I had in my house. My wife and I were sick, sore throats, so what do we do? Let's get a humidifier. I'm newly married, this is my job, I'll do this. I go off to the store, this is what I get. Pretty standard. I could have spent $30, I could have spent $200. They pretty much look like this. So this is my kitchen, we're brewing some beer. It doesn't fit. When my wife has a choice of bringing things into, her, into our home, what are they? They're brightly colored. They're made of wood. They're made of stone. They're patterned. The aesthetic is wrong. How it looks is wrong. So that's the challenge. Not everything in our home is brightly colored. Look at all of our appliances. They all look like this. This isn't novel technology. These are vessels to hold water. These are vessels to heat water, to grind beans. But year after year, you go to the store, you get more of the same. These things hold water. You could heat these up. You could put a motor in, grind some beans in them. Why can't our appliances look like this? So before I set up shop, let's talk about value. Because I think, you know, as an engineer, I want to break things down. I work in the realm of function. My customers want things to work. The customers I typically work with in the government, they don't necessarily care how they look. So, you know, I'm not an expert on aesthetics. But as an engineer, I can look at these things and break it down. And so I say, what do we have? We have form, we have function, we have cost. That's the basic decision you can make. And we can apply it to appliances. What's the visual appeal of this appliance? What's the quality? The quality is, it makes humid air. Maybe it will make my wife and I feel better. I didn't have a choice on visual appeal. You know, what else out there do I make decisions on every day that follow the same pattern? And food is huge. We all eat it. You can boil this form, function, and cost down to taste and nutrition. I can have a gourmet meal. It can be delicious. It might not be good for me. But I'm willing to pay top dollar for it. And what I'm getting at is there's a value to things. What the form is, what the function is, what the cost is, we all place values on things. And locally, what's beginning to work is local food. In this room, every weekend, over a thousand people show up to purchase locally produced food. There are 25 vendors in this room. So when I say, hey, I want to set up shop making humidifiers, why don't we look at a model that works? It works here. Farming's a hard business, hugely capital intensive. But in this community, we have a thousand people coming through this door at the Somerville Winter Farmer's Market purchasing from 25 different vendors. And so what is it? How do these farmers do it? Well, they directly sell to their customers. And I'm talking about farmer's markets, but also a really exciting model called community supported agriculture, a model that's been around for a while. The consumer and producer get together. So at the beginning of a growing season, large numbers of people from the community, a few hundred, get together with a farmer and say, I will pay you up front for this year's harvest. We're in it together, let's share the risk. If it's a good season, we get more. If it's not so good, well, then we get a little less. The interesting thing about the local food movement is people are willing to pay top dollar for it because they value it. The taste is worth it. The nutrition is worth it. And so they pay extra. And that's great because what you want when you make a purchasing decision is not the bottom line cost. You balance these three things to get value. Why can't we have some kind of appliance market? Why can't we have community supported manufacturing? Can we not find a local designer and a local artist to get together, propose a design, and would 200 people pay $200 for a locally produced humidifier that both works in form and function? There are 80,000 people in Somerville. Would less than one half of 1% of our population go for that? I think the answer is yes. But before I get to the numbers. 
what's really interesting about the community supported model is it's all about a dialogue between the consumer and producer. I would love 200 people to sign up to get a humidifier and pay 200 bucks. I'd have $40,000 in cash. As a designer, I'd love that challenge. But it's not my decision. It's an active dialogue between the consumer and the producer to say, what is the value? Maybe I want better materials. Maybe I need it to be cheaper. But we can start that discussion. And so, from an engineering standpoint, how can we do this? Can we produce it? Is $40,000 a reasonable number to produce a product? And so, why do things look like they look today? This model, just a basic economic model, has three factors into it. Two of them you probably recognize, one of them you might not. The idea is, I got a quote from a vendor, and I said, I want to take that vessel that holds water in the humidifier, and I said, I want to make 200 of them. And they said, great, it'll cost you about $8 per unit. Not bad. But these numbers have that big one on the top, and it's something called tooling. So the reason things look the way they do today, things made out of plastic, is because plastic parts are cheap when you make thousands of them. You have, but you have to make the mold, the tool. And so to make one vessel, to make one mold for one vessel, it would cost over $40,000. What if we imagined the future? What if technology allowed us the possibility of doing toolless fabrication? What if we can make products without that mold? We could shift the economy. We could shift that tooling cost, which is meant to make and build a part, to labor, to the artist, to the designer our neighbors. So what if we had a model that said, look, I can take that tooling cost and I can spread it over. I can spend 10 times the amount on materials. I can choose better materials. Instead of pe paying people minimum wage, why don't we pay them a livable wage? And because there was so much wrapped up in that tooling, there's enough left over for incredible design from artists. Toolless fabrication is here, it is possible. One way to do it is what's known as 3D printing. And it's been around for decades. The concept is that you don't need a mold. You produce parts in real time. It's kind of like extruding clay through a nozzle. It just sprays it out. There's different ways of doing this. This happens to be in plastic. What's exciting is it's been around for decades. Machines like this cost no more than a desktop computer now. But what gets me really excited is this is in plastic, but you get the artists involved and they're experimenting in concrete, in ceramic, in metal. So as you look at this and say, well, that's another plastic part, we don't need that. People are working on the right materials that have the right form, that have the right function to make it real. What we need is, I'm proposing some kind of community supported manufacturing model. And it involves three big pieces. The engineers, we can build the tools, but we need artists and designers who have the vision to tell us what tools do they need? Do they need something in ceramic? Do they need something in wood? And then finally, we need the community to get involved. And it doesn't just go one way. Customers can say, hey, artists, could you do this? Hey, engineers, is this possible? And so we can live in a future where you can have something that looks like these clay pots as a humidifier. And the real question is, as, as a consumer, you have to demand more. Demand something unique. Demand something that expresses your values and reach out to local artists and say, is it possible? Local designers, could you do better? And in the future, every object in your home could be a work of art. Thank you.